first of all, how many of you have experience with omics data? Just as like really analyzing it, not only hearing about it. Yeah. Okay, so not that many. So I'll try to make it as understandable as possible. So the plan is this. Why is it not going forward? I can't. Okay. So I'll give a short introduction to omics data, very general, and to nano-specific omics data. And then I'll give a very short intro to a program that is useful for analysis of omics data. And then we'll go into a hands-on session, really clicking away on, on this, in this, in this type of data. And, um, so omics is maybe sometimes a bit confusing. People hear about omics, but mostly it's about transcript omics to this date. There is several levels of omics data, so you can profile different ohms on DNA, RNA, epigenomic level, proteomic level, and metabolomic level. But to this date, transcriptomics is still sort of the the way to go because it's been used uh, for quite a long time. So there's the techniques for profiling transcriptomics is very established or are established. And the knowledge we have on genes and how they regulate other types of molecules is very established. So we have <coughs> we can also based on transcriptomics to some extent uh, predict the the um, profile of another ohm, especially proteomes, or the proteome. So, but usually when you hear about omics, it's going to be about transcriptomics, and especially within nano, other omics are still only coming out. Now there's two different techniques for, at the moment, for um, profiling transcriptomics. Microarrays have been the le legacy, or are the legacy technology since way or several decades, and um, there's a lot of data available for with that type of technique. Although sequencing is still getting bigger and is has a greater sensitivity and gives a lot more information, so there will be more sequencing. But microarrays are still also higher throughput. You can establish methods to make them, uh, to look at a lot more samples at once. And so far, Nano has still only used microarrays, only a few sequencing uh, experiments, unpublished sequencing experiments that I know of. So, so this will be about microarrays. But largely, the end result of microarrays and sequencing is uh, luckily comparable. And, and, well, the most laborious part is the interpretation, and that is the same for sequencing in microarray. So this is really jumping on and off. I hope you can hear me, even though it's like <laughs> turning off in the middle. Um, so, the good thing about omics data is also that it's very standardized the way of um, uh, depositing it in databases. So, the data itself is very standardized and major scientific journals require you to deposit it in either the European Array Express or in, in the American GEO database. And the data itself is standardized, as I said, but the metadata is, of course, a problem, especially when you come to nano experiments. So the metadata is still not being properly um, documented in these databases. But still, you get the data, so that's, that's always a good thing. The, the task here would be then to connect the, data, the metadata to this data here, but the, these databases contain also nano-specific omics data. Then there's also a, a database for, specifically for nano-related omics data, NanoMiner, which was developed under the project NanoMune, and it's unfortunately not being updated at the moment anymore, so it needs to be reactivated, I think, I hope it will be. 
through some other project. But you can find uh, ready processed nano related data in this database. So, and you can already do some analysis steps in the database itself, but you can also download data and get more information on, on that data. Um, so, but what an omics analysis workflow normally looks like is you start off with experimental design that's similar to any other type of assay. You, um, but the two second steps, so the pre-processing and initial statistical analysis, and especially the computational interpretation are the most laborious parts and the most crucial parts also. So the pre-processing needs to be done properly to be able to really get good data out of omics uh, profiling. And finally, also to be able to make any biological sense out of it, you need to uh, analyze it with proper tools and, and compare it also to existing data out there. And that's the challenge. So what I'm going to show you here is a program called Chipster, which was developed in in Finland at the IT Center for Science. It is very good because it's, it implements our uh, bioconductor packages, so it, it's really following the development of bioinformaticians who develop the actual programs for, for analyzing omics data. But it doesn't need, um, you don't need coding ability, you don't need to be a, a bioinformatician where you, well, you will become a bioinformatician kind of when you use this program, but <laughs> you don't need to actually use our packages by yourself. And it's being increased, the use of it. It started in Finland, it's moved to Sweden now. It's free to use for academics and I think also research institutes. And it's becoming available also for all European researchers through projects. Uh, data um, infrastructure project, projects like Elixir. And um, so what Chipster is, like I already said, it combines and it all constantly also evolves and adds new tools that are uh, the latest tools that are recommended for omics analysis. So you can be sure that you're using the latest tools that are recommended. It's free, it's open source, it needs a server to run on, but as I said, it's being made available also for European researchers, so you don't have to have it on your own server. Um, it's very compatible with basically any type of big data. Not only microarray data, but also high throughput data can be incorporated. I haven't used it much for that, but it's, it's completely, um, able to do that too, and sequencing, of course. And, um, well, I'm gonna skip this goals because we know our goals, maybe. <laughs> um, but, so this is what it looks like. It has a very graphical interface. You have a, a up there, I don't know if I have, maybe with the, so up here you can see the data sets that you've imported. Here you have a workflow of what you're doing, so you, you never really have to remember what you're doing. You can always go <coughs> steps backward to see what has been done. You can also visualize whatever you've analyzed, and you have the tools up here, which comprises then over 350 tools from our bioconductor. And um, a good thing is, uh, Oh, okay, there were some arrows, so this is, you'll see this later, how it works uh, when we do the, the actual hands-on session. I'm going to open the program and show it to you, and then you'll get to, to do that on your own computers. And also a very good part is that if you know that there's a lot of data coming in with similar experimental design, so you you want to look at loads of nanomaterials and you've managed to, you've had funding for doing actually omics for 300 nanomaterials. 
then you can automate this analysis workflow. So you, you know that you want to normalize the, the samples in a certain way, you can, then you can do that in an automated way. So you don't have to do it for all 300 samples separately. And um, you can save the session, which makes it, yeah, you can continue working another day, you can share it with, with colleagues, and that includes then the data. You can run several different jobs at once, which makes it faster. With sequencing data, it's naturally slower as anything because sequencing is huge compared to microarray data. Um, you can visualize in several different ways. This is just a few of the ways. You can visualize expression um, patterns. You can visualize gene ontologies, looking at each gene in that ontology and how it's affecting in that data. You can compare samples, look at Venn diagrams, heat maps. Um, you can even look at the position of the, ex the differential expression uh, of the genes. So see whether a certain chromosomal region is being differentially expressed due to DNA damage of some specific sort. And um, you can do um, principal component analysis, so PCA plots, and look at clusterings or groupings of, of samples. That would be, for example, interesting if you have, if you have, as I said, you have, you've analyzed 300 different nanomaterials with, with certain parameters and, and you get omics data from all those, you can then basically cluster and see whether they group into certain groups, basically grouping nanomaterials. Of course, this is more complicated than, <laughs> than it sounds, but, but it's in principle possible. Then um, Chipster is sort of like, you, if you remember the, the first or one of the first slides where you saw the workflow, where you go through experimental design and then pre-processing and then um, uh, interpretation. Now Chipster is, is for me at, me at least, it's been best suited for the pre-processing step. So the, the step where you're, you're looking at the quality of the data, you're filtering the data, you're trying to find the, the features, the genes, in this case, that make the, that cluster certain samples in a different, or in a good way, or, or something like that. And then to visualize and get a feeling for the data. Well then, after that, going into the interpretation, I find that it's good to export the results from Chipster and go into online tools, which comprise a whole set of different tools, which I'm not going to go deep into today because I want to more yeah, show how omics data is, is really pre-processed and filtered. But I will give some examples in the end. So here on the side you see different tools that you can then um, look at gene networks or or interactions between genes and proteins to maybe identify proteins that you and predict basically what the proteins would be doing in a data set where you've found this type of uh, transcriptomic changes. So, so and the Chipster is also nice because it has a lot of tutorials. They have now a lot of um, YouTube tutorials and also on their own web page, there's a lot of information. So the next step will be basically to go into the, so if you go to the web, the agenda of, the, of this workshop, you'll find the tutorial underneath the session. So I have it open. So everyone just open it up and go through So the first uh, s um, steps just contain information on Chipster and on the data. Oh yeah, so I could go through the data a bit first before I continue. 
So I've chosen a data set that is openly available through Array Express, or was it Geo maybe? Usually Array Express and Geo have both the same data sets largely. So regardless of where you go, you find it. Uh, it's a data set that was tested on um, human small airway epithelial cells with um, multi-walled carbon nanotubes, tangled cheap tube version, and titanium dioxide nano belts, so fiber-like uh, titanium dioxide, and then two doses and two time points for each of these. And we're going to go through this tutorial by, so if everyone, do you have the tutorial open? So if you then go into that and go down to the first open a pre-made analysis session in Chipster to explore results, then you'll find a link and click on that link. You'll get into a page that looks like this. Has everyone found it? Oh, and on Mac, there might be some problems opening the program. I haven't tried it myself on Mac, but there are um, instructions on the Chipster webpage on how to uh, get it open on a Mac if you have problems. You can just try it at first. It works? It works. Great. Perfect. Okay, so then you just click Launch Chipster. You keep the file, open it up, and then you log in with guest guest. So both password, um, user account and password is guest. And you won't be able to run tools with this version or the, the this account. But um, okay, it opened. But you'll be able to open the session. So also from the same web page, from the same workshop web page, you'll find the data. And you can download that. Oh. So I'm logging in with my own account, which means that I will be able to run tools just to show you that you won't be able to do that, but if you want to later on, then you can follow instructions in the tutorial which tells you where, who to contact depending on which country you're in at the moment. <laughs> oh, this is good. Okay, but the, the ones who have it open, you can continue according to the tutorial. And the ones who don't, you can just look at this. And also the, one, the other ones, you can look at sort of the start of it all. So basically, you have data up here. And it's cell files, because Affymetrics generates. When you do a nomics experiment using Affymetrics platform, you get cell files. And that's, that's what you get. You can't open them with any normal program on your own computer. You just get these files, which include all the information you need to, to extract the, the expression of the genes in each sample. And what you do in Chipster is you just import these cell files. So you have all 30 files, there's 30 samples, and you have 30 f cell files here. You see that they're all uh, colored in the upper box. And down here you have a box showing all 30 files, and you can use that box to do an analysis. And to do something, you go from, you choose this box and you go up here. In this case, we have mi microarray data, so you want to go to the microarray tab. And you can do quality control. So then you go to the next, so you choose quality control, you go to the next box here. I'm going to move this. And again, you have affymetrics, so it's easy. You go with some of the affymetrics things. You might want to know whether you have affymetrics exon, gene arrays, or affymetrics something else. But in this case, you just try affymetrics basic. Sounds good. Then you go to the next box where you can show parameters. In this case, there's only 
the image size that you can change, so you can't really change any other parameters, and you click run. And then you will get boxes, so in this case you can see the job running down here, but I've already run it, run it before, so, so you have all the files already here. And then you can um, double click or click once and then click enter to look at that PDF file, which is going to be a quality control uh, image. So and a relative log expression plot is what you usually compare the, the, the data with and check whether there's any outliers. So in this case, all the, the average of the, the relative log expression seems to be the same in all samples, which is good. That means you can keep all your samples. There seems to be some differences in the, in the um, distribution of, of the gene expressions. But that might be, if you see something like this, it might be due to biological reasons. So it's not, it's not necessarily a quality issue. And later on you will see that it indeed has to do with something biological. You get a lot of other files. I'm not going to go through all of them. Um, there's also a file on, on um, DNA or RNA degradation plot. It's something that Affymetrix also recommends to do as a quality control. If all samples look the same, then you're safe. If there's suddenly a line going the other way, then, then you might want to exclude that sample. Then, um, then what you do, you go back. So this was just an initial quality control. You go back to the original data and you want to normalize it. So you choose again the tool from here. You again, you know you have affymetrics. You go with affymetrics. You show parameters. You choose a normalization method. You might, there's several different normalization methods. In this case, RMA is given as a default, and I know that for affymetrics, it's and for transcriptomics in general, RMA robust multi-array um, normalization is is a standard way to go, and it's it's usually used. So I go with that. I also have to choose the chip type to be able to map the the probes on the Affymetrics platform to actual genes that are updated constantly, I need to choose the platform uh, that was used in this case. And that information you can get from Array Express from wherever you downloaded the data. And in this case, I know that it's the human genome U133A version, version 2. So it, it's information that you get from the website. You choose that, and then you click Run and you get a file like this. I'm not going to run it now. Normalization takes a bit longer. so. And you get a file where you have also the information of what you did in the parameters. So you can go back looking at the parameters. You, um, you can double click on it or click enter and look at it and you see the actual data. And you have samples and probes which have now been mapped to genes. And then you have the log expression of each gene in each sample, and it's normalized. So this is a file you can extract from Chipster and use in other tools. It's something that can be yeah, used for other online tools, but you can also go on analyzing it in Chipster. You also need to specify the, the samples, of course, so you get also a pheno data file. So if we go back here, you see that it's a, called a pheno data file. And you click on it, and you can add information. So when you get the pheno data file the first time, it's empty. It doesn't have other than the number of samples <coughs> in a row. And you have to know what those samples are. So it's the name of the cell file and that is linked to an annotation in Array Express. And you can then um, you can then map that to or annotate the, the samples in the Feno data file. So you might want to put a description uh, column and you can then add columns also according to your need. So in this file, so here you can add a column, just write whatever 
uh, let's say we want to, in this case we only have one type of cell, but you want to specify cells, you can add a column here. So it appeared here in the end. And you might have other parameters, nanomaterial, uh, time, dose, replicate, so which uh, experiment the sample belonged to. You might have done the experiment in, in three or four or five or six replicates, and you might want to specify which control belongs to which sample. And, um, and then you can have many other five um, columns, so you can even add um, other types of descriptors, so if you have FISCAM data for these uh, nanomaterials and you have a lot more nanomaterials, then you can add that, for example. And, um, and then use it in, in the consequent um, analysis. So then what you do, the next step, which is also fairly important, to get rid of all the genes that have not been expressed in any, type, in any of the samples. It's unnecessary to keep all the data in there. And especially for the statistical analysis later on, it's, it's good to get rid of unnecessary noise. So you want to filter the data. In this case, I've filtered so that everything under six uh, log expression is filtered away. So if there's any gene that is expressed only under six, the level of six in every sample, then it's taken away. So you can then look at the previous file and see up here, it says that it contains 12,129 rows, so that means that many uh, genes. You go to the next file, the filtered file. Huh? Okay. <laughs> and you see that there's only 9,000, a bit more than 9,000 genes left. So that might be a good start for an analysis. You can use all this data to do an initial um, clustering or visualization of sort, some sort, and I chose to do a, a PCA analysis, so a, a principal component analysis, which um, takes the whole data and, yeah, Pekka is better at explaining what a PCA does, but <laughs> basically compares the the samples to each other and, and relate them to each other to see whether there's any types of clusterings. And you can visualize it and you can even then turn on the visualization and look at the samples. So in this case it's colored according to group, which in this case doesn't say anything. You might want to color it according to something else. And you see that there are two groups already. So you might want to look at uh, from here you can change the coloring. So you might want to look at um, time, for example, which I know was the reason to why those two groups were appearing. So time seems to be a very strong effector of the cells uh, changing in expression. So regardless of the exposures, both the controls in each of these groups are, are different from, yeah, the one hour time point is different from 24 hours. So now that you know that these two groups are one and 24 hours, so sorry, you can see that from here, uh, then you might want to look at other factors. So you look at maybe nanomaterial. So this is information that I put into the Feno data file that I showed before. So based on what, whatever you put in there, you can then color according to that. So if you have other types of descriptors, you can color according to those. And you click on, on nanomaterial coloring, where you then see that the red dots are the control, the green dots is titanium dioxide, and blue dots are multi walled carbon nanotubes. So then, and you remember that this was the 24-hour time point, so it seems that at 24 hours, titanium dioxide is doing much more than what multi walled carbon nanotubes are doing compared to the control. So just initial um, looking at the data and getting some type of hypothesis for how to continue analysis, uh, and the analysis. 
You can do other types of uh, visualizations. You can um, uh, do hierarchical clustering, which is appearing a bit slowly. It takes a while for it to show where you, again, see two groups. And if you look at the samples, it's one hour and 24 hours. You can look more into detail within those two groups. You can look at the gene expressions within those two groups and form some hypothesis that then leads you on to a, the next step of analysis. So, yeah. Um, what time is it? So I think I'm already past. So I'm not going to go forward with the tutorial. It's basically doable by yourself. You can, there's questions in it and there's answers in the end. You can either figure out the question or the answers before you look at the answers or, or just look at them straight away. Um, and there's, yeah, this is basically how you do an analysis and you get to differentially express genes at some point and you get to different steps that you can then export into other uh, database or other online tools. And in the tutorial in the end, there's also some uh, more advanced suggestions on how to use the data and how to go into online tools and look at networks of genes or, or predict some new protein um, interactions with those genes and maybe get a hypothesis based on transcription factors. Or, and you can also export the data and then go into uh, the Wiki Pathway tool Path Visio, which is also listed in the tutorial, and plot the data on top of known path Wiki Pathways that you want to visualize, and you, you've seen those in, in gene ontology analysis that you've done based on the data, and you want to look at what that pathway actually looks like with different genes popping up with different levels of expression. And in Wikipathways, there's actually some nano-specific um, pathways that can be used, maybe might be interesting to, to look at this type of data with. So that was it. Yeah, not much time for discussion, but <laughs> any questions? You can also contact me later if there's something that comes up. Should I?